Run it up, to run it back. Yeah. Run it up, to run it back. Run it back. Run Good it morning up. and happy Tuesday morning. This up, is Run It Back run it Live. Back. Yeah, yeah. Very bright and early. Might have some trouble getting words out today. <laughs> Sham Sharania, he'll he won't have any trouble. Chandler Parsons, Eddie Gonzalez. We start out with some confusion, um, and we will get into that in a second because Shams had some news yesterday, which then trickled down into a million other things. Shams, kick it off. Yeah, so from what I'm told, Kyrie Irving uh, has reached out to LeBron James to see whether James would come to Dallas. And we know Kyrie Irving is a free agent. And to me, this is more a subplot of his upcoming free agency. Clearly, he, he's become kind of a recruiter, putting on his recruiter cap, wants the Mavericks to improve their roster. And I, I do believe there's seriousness to Kyrie Irving wanting to play with LeBron James. We've seen it the other way around the last two years. It's been rumored that LeBron... Uh, wants to play with Kyrie Irving in LA and now you're kind of seeing the, the, the script being flipped a little bit um, and I, I think there's no question both Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic want the right players around them in Dallas um, and so it's unlikely that LeBron James is going to end up in Dallas just like it is I think unlikely that Kyrie Irving ends up with the Lakers I think LeBron mm. James is happy in LA his son Bronny is going to play for USC this season um, but listen, in some ways, there is a good amount of leverage here that even LeBron James gets for something like this because there's no doubt he wants his team in L.A. to improve. The workload that he, that he had last year going into age 39. Um, so we'll see how this impacts uh, Kyrie Irving's free agency. What? what, what? <laughs> uh, I was about to take a sip of water. You need a coffee mug. Um, your drink? I, I don't, Sorry. Yeah, I just don't know how it would work, Sean. Like, first of all, you're too good, because I don't even know what? how you know this. I don't even know how this gets <laughs> out. Like, how is this news? But you're really good. But you're how does it work? <laughs> Who do they get rid of? Like, what are they trading everybody? Are they trading Bertans, Hardaway, Hardy, Green, every pick they have, I don't know, in the next 10 Not years? Happening. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. But if you can go and get a LeBron James obviously do you try and do it sure like I think but for one year because he's already made it clear he's going to go try and play with Bronny if he were to have that opportunity right so I don't understand how this would work but yeah if you can go and get arguably the greatest player of all time why not yeah like it's 48 million dollars this? salary like yeah, how do you like, even do that on that team uh, shout out to Kyrie I'd love for LeBron to be part of run it back like I'd love for him to play for a <laughs> bunch of teams like I bet he would, the worst kept secret in the league the last year is these two desperately want to play together. Like, they, they have not hit it at all. My thing when I watch this is the Lakers, Oof. they have clearly, they have made it clear that they don't want to trade a haul for him. They've had three opportunities to go get him and did not. Mm -hmm. um, Dude, does, 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 does Mark Cuban want LeBron? I bet he does. But how do you even make that happen? Would you even do that? LeBron's not leaving L.A. Kyrie's not going to L.A. apparently, so... It's, I don't want to say it's a non-story, but it's just a hilarious, another hilarious Kyrie LeBron thing. Not, like, not at one mention, point they'll play together again, I'm sure. Once you get them, then how do you fill out the roster? You just hope guys take way less and get guys on minimum deals to kind of surround this trio. That would be really good. But again, I just, I don't, I don't see how it's possible and I don't like why did they leave each other in the first place if they just want to go right. back and that'd be the big storyline sometimes you think grass is greener and it turns out it's not it's all dead and garbage but here's the thing let me be the ass for the minute for um <laughs> Kyrie as a recruiter just hear me out is it possible that Kyrie knowing that he wants the big max deal and that half the world thinks it's a bad idea and the other half thinks they're stuck and they have to do it is he just not showing himself as a quote recruiter Look at me, I'm invested in the team. I love Dallas, I wanna be a maverick. I wanna make the team better. Look what I'm trying to do in a ploy to sort of bamboozle the front office and being like, no, he's totally yeah. in. Yeah, and you know what? It gets the fan base on his side too. Like, oh my gosh, look, he's trying to recruit LeBron James. It's like he went for the, the big whale, like yeah, the biggest so of the whale. I definitely get it. But then also at the same time, he's going to Lakers playoffs games in LA yeah, trying to get leverage true. from other teams. So I think he's definitely playing a little chess, not checkers, but also he's an extreme talent. And like you said, maybe it is a bad idea to sign him long-term this summer, but they made their bed and now they're sleeping in it with him. And I think he goes back there. I think he gets a three or four year max deal there because they have to. Mark has to, right? He gave up a lot of assets to get Does him. He have to? It, it didn't really pan out for this three month trial last season. But I mean, you're looking at still the best backcourt going into next season if they lock up Kyrie Irving and Luca. So, Ch Chandler, you've been a recruiter at different points. I mean, how often are you going after the big guy, you know, the, the big fish? And then you, if you don't get the big fish, which clearly like, the odds of him actually getting LeBron James, I don't know 
what they are. You know, I think it's zero to zero point zero. Point zero, maybe I zero mean, five. But like, <laughs> at what point, if you're Kyrie Irving, is this a ploy to get other players that are also in the marketplace? It's Does this set the stage for that? A little bit of both. And I, I was 50%. I got Dwight Howard when I wanted him, and then DeAndre Jordan just broke my heart. <laughs> and that was actually for Dallas as well. So, uh, yeah, it's tough because you want to better your team. You want to make your job easier. So you want to get the best possible players. Um, this just seems like a, this seems like a, you know, he's swinging for the fences here and it's probably not going to happen. But listen, do they even become an immediate contender if LeBron goes there? Like how many games does he play? Is he going to still play at the same level he played this year? Like I'm not putting all my eggs in a basket. He already just did that. Mark already just did that with Kyrie Irving. I'm not doing that again for LeBron James for one year. For one year. Okay. So as a recruiter. With Kyrie, I mean, we've seen with KD. Is he a good recruiter? <laughs> well, we'll see. I mean, what's, what's his? Uh, what is the game plan? I mean, what's the resume? I mean, I guess the resume is Kevin, and if you let them tell it, you know, they came to that together right. and, and just needed a needed a city, and it didn't it didn't end as great as they wanted it to. They both <laughs> admitted that. Well, look so how fun they were. It's Kyrie. Kyrie's an enigma because. Everybody in the league loves him to a man, and he's just like a great guy. And they they think he he plays beautiful basketball. And but if you ask like ownership for different teams or general managers or maybe not even coaches, I feel like coaches mm. like him too. He's he's obviously a very interesting character. And, and can he get LeBron to Dallas? Probably not. But is he smart and does he know exactly <laughs> what this means as far as his leverage for getting a contract, for his ability to get other guys, mm. for the way he looks as a team player, and all of that? Oh, he knows all this for sure. He's brilliant. He knows exactly what he's doing. You know what it feels like? He's like the NBA Leonardo DiCaprio. He gets all the <laughs> baddest ones, but they don't last. <laughs> By yeah. the way, the latest Leo DiCaprio, just to go off Another on a tangent, one. is Gigi's 22-year-old friend. It's crazy. How? And the, again. He must be dumb, because if he's just talking to 20-year-olds, then there's nothing going on up there. I don't think too much That's my own two cents. Shut up, Chandler. Chandler's like, he's my hero. Yeah, um, he's awesome. Let's just put on our make-believe hats for a second and, and, and just think that this could potentially be something. What can Dallas even offer in a trade? Well, it, it would have to be literally their biggest <laughs> salaries. They have two first-round picks that they can trade. <laughs> you, you really have to go all in on that. The only other option, if you're not going to get acceptance on Tim Hardaway Jr., Maxi Cleaver, basically you stack these mm. contracts together, two first-round picks, and if that, you know, obviously that's a hard sell uh, for, for the Lakers. Luka Doncic is the only other player, and they're not going to trade Luka, <laughs> right? So you're trying to get LeBron James on a team with Luka and Kyrie. Um, but listen, like, is there a universe where if LeBron, if LeBron James is like, I want to be in Dallas, and if there's if there are players in the league that have built up the equity to say, I want to go here, trade me here. I mean, Kevin Durant just a few months ago, he wanted to go to Phoenix, he ended up in Phoenix. So, but again, that's a, that's a very alternative universe, you know, that that I don't think we're living in. I that's mean, the it's... market, though, right? Yeah. <laughs> Two young guys, another starter, a hall of draft picks. <laughs> and those are things that Dallas doesn't have. Like, how does, what does you even trade for LeBron James at this point in his career? Can you just play three? I mean, if you could just play three. <laughs> yeah, and again, they might want that. <laughs> the Lakers don't want Tim Hardaway. They don't want Bertans. They, like, what, they, what, they have to be, there has to be some sort of Jalen Brown, some, some staple piece right. in the trade to make it work or make sense, in my opinion. And three way trade? Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, they got to bring oh in a God. three. Yeah, now we're talking Leo, Leonardo DiCaprio, and three ways all of a sudden. <laughs> so. We're back, baby. This show it's is early. taking a turn. <laughs> 7 <-08. laughs> Tuesday. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> if you're Luca, by the way, we haven't even really talked too much about Luca. It's, it's still his team last time I checked. If you're Luca, do you even want LeBron James? Yeah, I would, because we all know how passive LeBron James is. We all know how he likes, he hmm. gets off by making the extra pass, playing unselfish, almost to a fault this season. Um, but yeah, I think Le Le Luca just needs help. He, he would love to have Kyrie Irving back. He would love to have LeBron James. He would love to add just pieces that can kind of manage his workload, not make him have the ball so much in his hands. And there's going to be still games where he dominates and he takes over games. And he, it's his team. No matter who they bring in this year, it's still his team. But yeah, if you can get a generational talent like LeBron, who's also going to fill the stadium, the, the amount of jersey sales, everything that LeBron brings, <laughs> the Mavs and Luca would, would die for. But again, it just seems very far-fetched. LeBron in another jersey? That's just weird to think about. Well, I, it's, it, I mean, his history says if he goes, he'll get to a title at some point. I mean, I don't know if he's doing that at 38, 39, 40 years old. But it, if this is the best player on the market, the Mavericks should pursue him. I think on the flip side, like the Lakers, 
People have been saying this for a while. They should consider what they can get for him going forward. And if that's – if they can – he has – what does he have, a player option next option season? Next season. So they have to consider their future without LeBron James. This is, I don't think, the deal. But maybe that deal exists. Maybe there is a three-team trade. Maybe there is something. I wonder if deep down in the truth box that they have over there, the crypto, if they actually would consider a LeBron James trade. I think they should. I don't know if they would. We always talk like LeBron has all the leverage, and, and maybe that is true, but the team itself, the Lakers, how much leverage do they have over him? I mean, to an extent, I think both sides right now, it's interesting. You know, the Lakers, they just make those trades at the trade deadline, get all those guys, D'Angelo Russell, Malik Beasley, Jared Vanderbilt, Rui Hachimura, that can help them win right now, and they end up going to the Western Conference Finals. D'Angelo Russell gets benched in Game 4, and I think overall, when you look at the landscape, when you talk to team executives, they feel like, uh, you know, the Lakers could be in the market for a point guard, right? So when you think about the available point guards, Fred Van Vliet, Kyrie Irving, their best bet might be to bring back D'Angelo Russell. But I think what you're going to see over the next, this, you know, between now and July 1, July 2, is like, can they get a point guard? Can they, uh, can they see what's available in the marketplace? And so uh, LeBron James, clearly the workload he had this year, at the age of 38, can he do the same thing at 39? The amount of games he played, the minutes that he played, even in the playoffs, the minutes that he was playing, on a torn tendon, um, I think this this offseason will be interesting to see how much the Lakers prioritize decreasing that workload for him. Yeah, again, I think it's something they explore. I think they look for it. If they can get something in return that can pair well with what they just traded for this deadline, then, yeah, go for it. But, again, I think we all agree that this is kind of far-fetched and, and Dallas just seems like more of a want than actually So happen. if you're the Lakers, like, how do you go about this offseason trying to decrease the workload? on LeBron, or, or, or do you think you don't or, need to? I, I, even like last year, I wish they would have started the year with that team. They were a real team, right? They were yep. a contender, they were deep, they had shooting, yep. their, their pieces made sense. That team that they threw out there in the beginning of the season didn't even make sense, and they had no shot. They started off two and 10 or two and 12, whatever it was, but uh, you know, I think they have to continue to get depth. They have to re-sign Austin Reeves, and, and I, I agree with you, Sean, but I think there's not really a better option out there than D'Lo this summer at point guard. Um, although he struggled in the postseason, I mean, it's, it could be the best they could get. So I think they kind of run it back here. They, they try and save LeBron's legs as much as they can, but it also has a lot to do with Anthony Davis, right? He's got to be healthy. He's got to be a dominating player that he's been in the past. It's Austin funny. Reed's it's, highlight reel. It's yeah. funny how the cookie crumbles, right? They're the only team that got swept by the Nuggets now. The, the, even the Timberwolves got a win off the True. Nuggets. But they beat the Warriors. So it's like, yo, what is this team exactly? Are they true contenders? Can they beat the Nuggets in a series with what they have? They beat the Warriors. The Warriors are the reigning champions. What are they? I, I agree with Shams. I think they need a point guard to obviously seek that out. They should be wondering if they can get Kyrie to L.A. They should be thinking about that rather than LeBron to Dallas. But I feel like that's part of this. Kyrie's up to something. I need the He's most chaotic version of this story. Basically, Chandler yeah. wants them to run it up and run it back. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Do the rest of the lyrics. <laughs> Rapid, okay. Chan. I don't uh, know. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a special Chandler. Why don't you tell us who's coming up next after the break? We got arguably the best coach in the NBA, my favorite coach I've ever played for, <laughs> head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers, JB Bickerstaff. Coming up next, <laughs> Bernie Sun. Gotta love the video, head coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers, also Chandler's former coach, favorite coach, which I think is saying a lot, JB right. Bickerstaff, good morning. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, we have gotten to know Chandler a little bit over the course of the year, so my only really most important question is, is this dude even coachable? <laughs> <laughs> uh, morning to y'all. You work with him every day, so you know the answer to that question. Uh, it's a lot of mind games with Chandler to make him think everything was his idea, and then he would buy in. Damn, was, by the way, I love that we have a highlight tape introducing yeah, yeah. coach. Hi, video. <laughs> well, my favorite JB story is my first my first ever workout, right, the NBA, was a group workout in Minnesota, and he was on the staff for the Timberwolves. And I just remember all the best wings in the 2011 draft were in this workout. And I just remember going up to JB and I was like, hey, like it was like Jimmy Butler, Kawhi. I was like, put me, put me against those guys, right? Like, I, cause I was like, I wasn't a projected lottery pick. <laughs> and it actually turned out that I played really, really well. JB ends up getting hired with McHale in Houston. Huh. And sure enough, I think I sold him that workout because he ended up <laughs> drafting me. Is that true or false? We, we were coach? desperate at that position. We, we were desperate at that position <laughs> at the time. So we, we, made, <laughs> we took what, the best available. Yeah. 
best available. <laughs> <laughs> this is starting out good. J JB, I know you guys wish you guys were still playing right now in the NBA Finals, lost the Knicks uh, in, in these playoffs. Now that you've had a little bit of time to reflect, uh, what did you learn from that? What, what did you, any regrets? Do you, how do you view that series as you guys move into the offseason next year? I mean, it was a great learning lesson for us. Uh, and that's what it comes down to is, you know, there are processes that each team has to go through. There are steps that you just can't skip. Uh, and I thought this was a great learning lesson for us. You know, there's the unwritten rules of engagement that change in the playoffs. Uh, and our guys and, you know, myself included, uh, we had to go through that together as a group to kind of figure it out. You know, I think uh, the Knicks found that, you know, they had an advantage with their physicality. Uh, so that's an opportunity for us to get better over the summer. We know we can improve on that. You know, to a man, we know we can get in the weight room. We know we can be more physical. We can be stronger. And it's not something that you can just turn on in the playoffs. Uh, it's something that, you know, throughout the season and over the summers, you have to continue to build on. Uh, and that's something that, you know, our guys are going to accept a, a challenge, and I expect them to be better for it next year. You had a young all-star on your roster, Donovan Mitchell. What's the best part about coaching him this year? I mean, he's just an awesome dude. Uh, and it's just that, you know, you, you forget and, you know, move aside of his talent because, you know, he goes out and he shows that every single night what he's capable of. Um, but his first conversation with me when we traded for him was, you know, coach me as hard as you want to. And he lived up to that. You know, a lot of superstars don't want to be coached. They don't want to have to listen. Um, but you could coach Donovan hard. You know, you could challenge him in front of his teammates uh, and he would accept those challenges. You know, and from day one, he came in and he just wanted to be a part of the team. Uh, you know, he was on vacation when we traded for him. Our guys had a group workout in Nashville. He left his vacation to be a part of the group workout. So uh, he came in and just wanted to be a part of the group and not separate himself. And that made my job extremely easy. I feel like I know the answer to this question, but D-Mitch recently said that he should have been first team All-NBA. Do you agree? And why? Because I feel like you got to agree. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I mean, I think his, his, his uh, you know, on the court merit gives him that, you know, it's not me being biased. Um, you know, you look at what he did throughout the season and how it impacted winning. And I think that's the thing is like, you know, there were, what, six or seven teams that won 50 games this season, uh, and we were one of them. And, you know, obviously a lot of that had to do with Donovan and his performance. You look at a guy who's, you know, numbers increased from last year to this year. Um, you know, you look at a guy who, you know, his numbers weren't empty numbers. You know, the guy had a 70-point game, 71-point game. We were down 20 at half. Uh, and he figured out a way, you know, to kind of will us to victory. So it's not like he was putting up empty numbers. Uh, he was putting up impactful numbers that led to, you know, winning at a high clip. So I, I definitely agree with Don. I, I feel like, you know, he should have been first team. Um, you know, again, I know we all would have traded that in to be, continue to play uh, further on. But, you know, he definitely earned it through the regular season, proved uh, that he was one of the top five players this year. So walk us through how you consume you know, playoffs in these finals. Are you are you watching players? Are you watching Spo and Malone? Are you taking notes? Like how exactly do you watch these finals? Uh, I mean, it's a combination of all those things. Um, you know, what I aim to do is continue to study and try to learn and get better. Uh, I want to be able to help, you know, this team and this organization as much as I possibly can. I want to be able to help our players as much as I possibly can. So, uh, you know, not only do I watch, but I, I listen too. And I think one of the things that, you know, in listening to Miami and the Heat uh, and, and Jimmy Butler and their comments, they keep saying that they don't care what anybody else thinks. Um, and when you play with that type of mindset, you know, you can play without any insecurities and play with complete confidence. You know, as an organization, you look at the heat and the nuggets from top to bottom and you see the consistency that's been there. You know, the consistency in their core players, the consistency in their coaching staff, front office, ownership group. Uh, you know, that allows your players to play with a freedom and a confidence where the only thing that they're thinking about is how do we go out and win to the highest level that we can possibly win. Uh, and I think that's extremely important. So as a coach, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how can we bring 
uh, you know, that same consistency? How can we bring that same level of confidence and shed the insecurities that you may get from listening to the outside world so your guys can be the best versions of themselves when it matters most? JB, what do you see as the biggest priorities for you guys going into this offseason? I mean, it's going to be our, our individual development, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, we are extremely satisfied with our core group of players. Um, you know, I don't think and I know I give Kobe uh, and Mike Ganzi and those guys a ton of credit because they've been able to pull uh, rabbits out of their hat. But, you know, it's going to be extremely difficult for them to go find a player that's better than the guys that we have currently on our roster. So uh, they have to continue to improve. They've got to keep working. Our coaching staff has to keep helping them develop. Uh, but, you know, I know Kobe and Gans and those guys, they'll go find, you know, complimentary players to help our young guys be the best that they can be. So our focus is what do we do to help our young guys continue to improve? You know, that's individually and that's us systematically putting them in position to be successful. Yeah, the Eastern Conference this year was loaded with you guys, Philly, Bucks, Celtics. Were you surprised that the Heat were the team to make it out of the East? I mean, you never bet against the Heat. Um, you know, I, I have to give them a ton of credit. Um, you know, they're one of the organizations that, you know, being in this game, you admire uh, because, again, there's never any panic and you know exactly who the Miami Heat are going to be. Uh, and for us, it's like, you know, they put it out there. And, you know, if you get guys who are tough, mentally tough, you know, physical guys that are willing to do all the dirty things, um, you know, it, it's that thing of, where chemistry, right, allows you to maybe overachieve and beat teams that may have more talent, but you've got better chemistry. You've got more consistency. You have a better understanding of your system. Like you can out physical and mentally tough teams. Uh, that gives you an opportunity to win. And I think, you know, the Miami Heat personify all those things. Uh, and again, it's one of those like learning lessons where you go out and you try to instill that in your group. And that's what, you know, we're trying to build here in Cleveland as well. Going to the other side of this series, you got the two-time MVP, Nikola Jokic. A lot of conversation about making him a scorer and, and how you handle that. How would you handle Jokic in a series? And, and, and do you think that's a real thing, we make him a scorer? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those pick your poisons, right? It's, you know, if you make him a scorer, what is that number to where he has to score, uh, you know, to actually make it work? Uh, I think with great players like that, you know, he's going to figure out a way to put pressure on you no matter, you know, what your defense does. And, you know, I think he's shown, and I know there's, I saw a number, you know, when he scores 40 points or whatever, but, you know, he's going to find a way uh, when it comes down to it to put pressure on you and to win games. So, uh, you know, you have to do the job. It's, you know, where the mistakes that you make that allow the other guys to become better players. And I think that's where you see a lot of that happening is, you know, the great players typically are going to be the best player in the series, no doubt. But there's always another guy or another, you know, two guys who make you pay when you make mistakes at key moments. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, when you're defending great players, like you have to figure out, you know, contain them, slow them, make their life difficult. But on championship caliber team, playoff caliber teams, you know, you have to make sure you don't make mistakes to allow the other guys to have a major impact on the game. JB, shout out to your dad, Bernie. He, he was a championship winning coach back in the day with the Bolts as an assistant. Um, I know you guys are close. What's the biggest lesson coaching wise or even as a person, human being that you've learned from him? Um, no, I'm again, I, I tell everybody this. Like, I've been extremely fortunate that I never had to look for a role model outside of my house. Um, you know, that includes him and my mom. So, um, you know, my dad, the thing that he taught me at a young age in coaching uh, and has translated to life as well is two things. It's you're honest with players. You know, they may not want to hear it in the moment, but as long as you tell them the truth, you know, or your truth, at some point in time, they'll respect you for it. Uh, and then the other thing is you treat everybody the same. You know, your 15th player, the ball boys, you know, the security guards, um, you know, they're no different as human beings than your best player. So you treat everybody with that same level of respect. Uh, and, you know, that's how you build environments. Uh, and that's how you get people to buy into something greater than themselves. 
So JB, does he still give you advice? Like, does he, does he, is he in your ear when you mess up? Does he, does he stay on you? Especially when you make, co you know, whether, whether it's a coaching error, whether it's some he sees in your, in your fashion game, like. Wow. What, you know, there is no fashion, fashion game. game. There is zero fashion <laughs> game, uh, JB. Listen, I, I have eliminated the fashion mistakes because um, I just keep it simple with a, with a polo or, or a pull-up. But no, my, my, like, this is my dad to a T. Uh, he has the link to the video cameras uh, in our gym. So he watches every single practice that we have every time that we come together in the gym. Uh, and about 95% of the time I leave the gym and I get to my phone, I've got three or four text wow. messages from him uh, already talking to me about, uh, you know, things, you know, where the coaches are standing on the sidelines, uh, you know, who was dribbling a ball while one of the coaches was talking. So he, he's on all of it, and he pays attention to it and makes sure I know everything about it. Huh. And first of all, you know what happened to your fashion style. He used to wear these Vince Carter draft day <laughs> baggy ass suits <laughs> till I got a hold of him, got him a tailor. Oh, man. But I always say be... Uh, it's hard to believe looking at you Are now. you going to agree, JB? <laughs> Once again, he's making you think it was your idea. <laughs> You yeah. just happened to come in at the league <laughs> in the time where big suits were going to smaller suits. So, yes, you had on the you know the little boy tight suits first, Thank you. but Aww. you were trending in that direction. That's what he does. That that was his way of complimenting. <laughs> that, that was it. That was nice. Okay. Uh, but I always say, Jay, I think being a head coach, it's it's you, it's you get an unfair deal, right? You see guys getting fired after being coach of the year or winning championships. Do you think it's become too much of a player's league where the coach always ends up being the scapegoat? No, not by, I mean, we know like what this comes down to is, you know, the league is driven by players. Um, but what organizations and, you know, teams have to understand, fan bases have to understand. And again, you can look at Mike Malone and you can look at Spo and you can look at these teams that have had um, you know, stretches of success, whether it was Bud, you know, you go back to even, you know, Dwayne Casey when he was in Toronto, like those teams were good teams and put themselves in position to be successful uh, because they stayed consistent. Uh, and, and I think what happens now is, you know, there's a lot of outside influences and pressures uh, and the coach is always the easiest one to blame. Right. You're the one who's standing out there and it's always easier for people after the fact, you know, to make comments about what you're doing. But, you know, you have to have faith um, from an organizational standpoint that you hired the right guy and you give that guy the right amount of time um, to do the job that you hired him to do and understanding the reality of the NBA. Like winning in the NBA at a high level, high level is extremely difficult. Winning in sports at a high level is extremely difficult and takes time, right? It's not something that just happens overnight. You cannot, especially if you, you know, skip the free agent groups, but like find teams that were built organically um, that just turned a corner and did it overnight. Everybody goes through painful moments. Uh, and, you know, again, not all coaches are perfect. Not all coaches are the right one for the job, but like if you see the group trending in the right direction, give those guys an opportunity to finish it and play it out. And I think, again, that's what you're seeing with Mike Malone and Eric Spolstra as we watch these finals. You guys both mentioned it. We're watching coaches get fired years after winning coach of the year, years after winning titles, going to the finals. How do you manage that as a coach? How do you manage those expectations? How do you get an organization to buy into your long-term strategy? Well, I mean, you, you have to do that in the very beginning of your conversations. And I, I've been extremely fortunate, um, you know, working with Kobe Altman and having a relationship with him where he and I have a similar vision uh, of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, obviously he was here with the Cavs, you know, at their peak. But when, I, you know, the change happens and now you're starting from the bottom and you're working to, uh, you know, rebuild a franchise and an organization, um, you have to be with somebody that you trust. And I trust Kobe uh, ultimately. Uh, you know, Dan Gilbert uh, has given us an opportunity to be extremely successful with the resources that he's given and the trust that he's put in us. Um, so, again, it takes a lot of conversations, a lot of communication, but you have to see some sort of progress. And I think that's one of the things where, you know, again, as a group, you know, we've continued to get better 
as individuals, our young guys have continued to get better. And I think, you know, as an organization, whether it was here in Cleveland or other places, you know, you do have to show some growth. Uh, but again, you have to have patience and you have to have an organization that trusts and believes and one that you're on the same page with. Like these businesses now are partnerships and you have to be willing, um, you know, to bend and compromise to make sure the partnerships work. Yeah, moving on to someone that we both <clears throat> spent some time with, uh, Dylan Brooks. Uh, I said he wasn't always like this, right? He did some things this season where I really rolled my eyes. Uh, what was your time like coaching him? Have you seen him change? Was he like this in Memphis when you had him? Uh, I mean, I had a great time with Dylan. Um, you know, one of the things that made Dylan who he was was the chip that he had um, on his shoulder. And... You know, that was why, you know, he was able to overachieve and be the player that he became and make it to the NBA. Um, you know, he is a tough minded defender. You know, he is a guy who, you know, his teammates embrace. Uh, he's a guy who will go out and do the dirty work in those things. So, you know, I, I you know, will hold comment on you know, some of the other stuff that's been said about him. Like all I can comment on is the time that I spent with him. Uh, and I watched him grind every single day to become a better player. I watched him go out and challenge guys defensively. So, uh, you know, that's what I can speak on uh, because that's the time that I spent with him. I mean, bringing things a little bit closer to home, he had that moment with uh, Donovan, the, the groin hit. Um, <laughs> did you say anything to him? Did, were you shocked? Were you surprised? Or that's just sort of what he is there to do? No, I, I mean, my focus is on our team. Um, I, I don't get involved in, you know, what other organizations, other players, other teams are doing. You know, in that moment, all I'm worried about and concerned about is uh, Donovan. Uh, and, you know, I was proud of Donovan's response. Uh, and I was <laughs> proud of Donovan's teammates' responses uh, to make sure that they had his back. So I'm not, you know, uh, in it for all of the sideshow stuff. Uh, you know, our focus is on our group, our team, how we respond, how we continue to get better. Uh, and, you know, that, that's where we focus. And then again, you know, other teams have how they do things. And I, you know, believe in every, everybody has the opportunity to do things the way they want to do it. Uh, and I let other coaches, other front offices, they handle their team. And we just worry and fo focus on our team. All right, Coach, very important question. You're a big Eagles fan. Jalen Hurst asks yeah. very nicely for a 10-day contract. Would you give him one? <laughs> well, that's easy. Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> yeah, what position do you want to play? How many minutes do you want? That's an easy one. Which number? That's, that's, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, whatever it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's easy. See, that's all he has to do. Guys winning at life. Coach, has been awesome. Do you want to, you want to do the honors to say yeah. goodbye? Yeah, JB, thank you so much. We look forward to next year. You guys got a good thing cooking over there. So look forward to seeing you soon. Love you. Appreciate you coming on. Love you too. Appreciate you guys. Thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you so much. We'll be back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I feel like that's... You should say goodbye. That's my guy. That's, That's your guy. guy. That's my guy. Run it up. Run it back. Oh, yes. It's time for you buying that. We got some stuff to talk about, and we're going to start with the serious right. one. Um, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver, of course, saying a John Morant suspension won't be announced until after the finals. That got a lot of uh, <laughs> heat. Chandler, are you buying that this is the right move? I think it is. I think the way he said it insinuated that he knows something we don't, right? Maybe I read it wrong, I hope he but does. I feel like he made it seem like there was other information, there was something else that we haven't been made aware of yet, but at the end of the day, this is a very serious situation. Obviously, it's something that he did twice, and it just shows that his 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 rehab stint or his therapy <laughs> session just didn't mean anything. It didn't change him, so I, I respect Adam Silver doing this, and not letting it take away from anybody that's playing in the finals. The Nuggets, the Heat, they deserve to be there. And this is a huge story. And that kind of takes away from what people are talking about. Kind of like the LeBron thing, acting like he's not going to come back next year at the timing of that. That wasn't <laughs> fair to the, to the team that just beat them in advance to the NBA Finals. So I respect it. Um, I do think the, pun the punishment is going to be pretty harsh. But um, I like this. Don't, don't give him any anything to talk about don't give people any distraction everyone should be focused right now on the two best teams in the league that are playing for a championship i'm gonna go the other way yep because he said like him saying this was a new story yep just mm. just tell us how many games <laughs> That's right. you know what i mean like th this idea that yo we can only have this one story going <laughs> well we have we're in the league with lebron james and kyrie irving and all these other players Giannis keeps telling us that you know it's fine that he lost and all this stuff <laughs> 
We can we can walk in and chew gum at the same time. Tell us how much how many games he's suspended. Because that is like how long are we waiting? He's not suspended till October anyway. Like, right, just, right. Just get it over with. Tell us what's going on. W one thing I do think is whatever the amount of games is, people will haggle about that amount. I know. For months. Not enough. Minute. Too many. Not, yeah, exactly. So that I buy that part. But can we bet on it on the on FanDuel you, Sportsbook? How many games it is? Think, that would be yeah. an interesting prop. Bet. What are, what are you? I, what are you over, I say a season. The, the over under was like forty. I think. I say a season. I yeah, I mean, I, I think I think that um, if you're going to announce this John Morant suspension, you either got you got to do it before the finals or after the finals. And they clearly didn't do it before. You, it's it's hard pressed to do it during because at that point, I do think it becomes somewhat of a un, like it, it unnecessarily you're putting that during the finals. Like you either address it beforehand, and I do think there. I mean, there was a window of time where they could have done it. Mm. You know, whether it's that Monday before the fi finals on a Thursday. Late in the week, yeah. could have done it earlier. Monday, first thing Monday, could have done it over the weekend. Like mm -hmm. again, but I'm I'm not. I'm and not. then we'd be over it by now, right? Do you think there's anything in the meantime, Ja? I mean, I know he did the cryptic goodbye tweet, which was just basically <laughs> saying goodbye to social media, but it was the timing was odd. Um, <laughs> is there anything he could be doing? You know, apparently, he unfollowed his buddy. Yeah, people care about the one that, in the, but... in the one in the video. <laughs> yeah, good, I guess, but. No, I mean it, the, the thing with him is he's he's it. he's killed all the goodwill he had with his half-ass apology and yeah. everybody going, yeah, that wasn't. We don't believe that. So honestly, the best thing to do is be silent and say goodbye. <laughs> That's insane. That's yeah, not I right. think honestly, wow. getting off right. social media, <laughs> keeping his circle small. I mean, again, like Eddie just said, no matter what he says or does, people aren't going to believe it at this point, right? He's already given mm -hmm. multiple opportunities, so I, I just think he needs to really work on himself. He needs to better himself, however that is, offline, off social media, with his family, and, and without these people he's surrounding himself with. I love this next one. It's an evergreen question. Been asking it for years. Uh, Silver also said the league's going to turn to expansion after media rights discussions next spring. Eddie, which city should get a team? Las Vegas, duh. Wow, yeah. like, that was easy. Put it in Vegas. Uh, I, I know everybody says Seattle. Yeah, everyone says Seattle. There's the idea that they'll do both, but put a team in Vegas. It's time. We've seen the Raiders. We, we've seen uh, the hockey. W. They go there. The hockey might get another championship. The Aces won a championship last year. Put it and put it in Vegas. Let's do that. Uh, figure out where to put that arena. I mean, I guess they could play in T-Mobile. Yeah. Yeah, they play there and, and deal with the traffic, but it, it makes the most sense. Yeah, I agree. I think you look what the hockey team's done. I think everybody around the world right. goes to Las Vegas. I think the success that they've had with, with multiple other franchises moving there, I think it makes the most sense. It's a huge market. I also, if it's not an expansion, I think you just replace one of these other cities. Like, how does Oklahoma City? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! Instead of they're Seattle, about to be great. You know, but I'm They're saying, about like, to be how great. Do they have Memphis, Cleveland, San Antonio. How does all these cities? Like, you're, 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 how does no, I'm Memphis? Saying, I'm saying how Chandler's going to be on the hit. You know, now OKC fans. No, I'm just saying, like, how is Memphis not in Nashville? You know what I mean? Like, how? You know what I mean? There's bigger <laughs> markets. There's better cities. There's, there's. You know what I mean? So. So you would rather just take one of the teams from a city that you hate, which you hate most of them, and put it in Seattle? Is that what you're saying? There's some really cool <laughs> cities out there, like Seattle. I don't know why they ever moved. That was such a great that was town, a big deal. such a great city, and they moved to Oklahoma City, which is not that you know electric of a town. <laughs> you know what I mean? They've been expanding the the downtown area. You, you've been to OKC? It's been a minute. They've been they've been it's expanding. Been Antonio, you wouldn't rather see the Spurs in Austin? No. Yeah, me neither. I'm literally a Spurs fan. That grew up <laughs> that lives in what is wrong with you? <laughs> you guys are gonna be beefing now. <laughs> I think Vegas is the ideal choice. Seems I think that's Vegas the biggest is the, market. Yeah, that's the, yeah. you know what I mean? And now that you've seen, there's a there's a track record that sports teams have gone there and they're thriving. And it, yeah. So yeah, I feel like that probably helps. Don't look at the don't look at the Raiders track record of uh, police blotter, but <laughs> besides that, yeah. it's been great out there. <laughs> well, there you go. That's a nice little turn that we took. Ooh, Jeff Van Gundy been in the news for a couple different reasons. Uh, this one with a few suggestions for the league. I love this. <laughs> Not really. Uh, eliminating free throws until the final four minutes. <laughs> And wants to reduce halftime to five minutes. Are you buying either one of those? Both? None? I like the halftime one. I do think okay. halftime is too long. Five especially minutes? Especially like a Super Bowl halftime is outrageously oh, long. Stupid. An NBA game, I think it's too long. But the free throws, now we're getting silly. Now we're going to change the rules. There's no double dribble next. Like this is a critical part of the game. This is. This is this puts a different dimension of pressure on guys to knock down a shot when the when the game's on the line. I, 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 you can't just take away a free throw. I understand what he's saying. It slows it down. It's it horrible to watch guys like James Harden back in the day that were shooting 25 free throws a game. It's boring and it's not exciting to watch. But it's 
too much of a critical part of the game to take it out. But the halftime is interesting. I definitely think that makes it quicker and almost better. Well, what goes on in halftime? Five minutes seems short. It's, it's some oranges. It's like, usually you like, do you yeah, potty? you go to the like, bathroom. You you, is there a line for the bathroom? Are there enough bathrooms put, for me? Yeah, there's enough. You go on your phone? Did you go on your phone? No, too? you know what? You, I mean, when I was younger, yeah, you would. But you kind of put it now away. Now that he's mature. He's yeah, mature. later in my years, I didn't. But no, the coach comes in. You kind of talk about adjustments. If you're up, what to keep doing. If you're down, sometimes they huh. throw some things. Sometimes it's aggressive, but it's too long. It's it's too long. But I again, it's, it gives fans time to go get drinks. You guys got they got to use they the restroom. Go potty. I mean, yeah. So I get it. We get to watch washed up rappers perform yeah. during halftime. But I also so like, like the guy with the dogs, dog. Like, yeah. I like the guy with the dog. The dogs is kind of fire. The yeah. baby race is Baby dope. races yeah. are good. We need time for the baby race. Do you care? Do you like either one of these? What about uh, no free throws in the final That's such a weird thing because does that mean we could just foul in perpetuity until the 44 like minute mark? Like, is it, that that's a little odd, but yeah, uh, the halftime thing, I mean, I think they could tinker with halftime, but stuff does, like arena stuff has to happen at halftime. Too. You know who doesn't want that are the play-by-play -play guys because that is their one break to get yeah. up and use the restroom. Yeah. And if you make it five minutes, that's it's rushing. I mean, I guess if you can still foul out, but there's just no free throws. I yeah. guess that could work, but there's got to be some sort of punishment. There has to be a penalty for fouling for, people. Yeah. For hacking. Yeah, you get the points. You Did the Mavs pull the job the off for, after these comments? Or, <laughs> or? Oh, there was that rumor yesterday that yeah. he was being uh, courted to be an assistant coach under Jason Kidd. I don't know how much. I'm not having any. I read everything that. and assume it's real. Uh, that's where we are at this point. So there's, there's something going on with the league. They're looking into these um, reports that longtime official Eric Lewis has been using a burner social media account <laughs> that responds to the criticism of his work. Brilliant! Uh, he's not among the 12 referees, referees selected to work these finals, and he has been many times before. Um, but here's where we're having an issue. A burner account, is that really grounds for suspension? Like, what's the rule break here? I mean, I, I, don't, I about? don't think so. It's not like he's doing anything illegal. He's it's not, not like he's doing anyone. anything malicious yeah. where he's threatening a player or he's fanning out. I guess there's the rumors that he's a Boston Celtic fan or something. But The like, rumors. <laughs> all these refs are human beings, and they were probably fans of a sports team growing up yeah. that they're refing for. But at the end of the day, having a burner account, it's hilarious. It shows that this guy's a little insecure and wants to clap back at people that <laughs> are shitting on him and his calls. But I don't I don't think it's yes. grounds to not put him in the finals. I don't think it's grounds to suspend him. him. And Eric Lewis is one of the cooler refs, so I feel for this. But it's it's I guess it's more amusing and entertaining that he he goes home or at halftime he gets on his phone I and, love he, it. and he tweets at people. Yeah, I mean I think the NBA's investigation is mostly around that, like having a referee being put in this situation. If this is true that you you have an account hmm. where you're tweeting, even even again I don't think anything is grounds for like. You know, uh, the Bri th this isn't on the Brian Colangelo no. when he was president of the Sixers and, and him and I guess his wife were <laughs> tweeting <laughs> like private information about the team and going at players right. and, and, and saying stuff that was very, very, um, that was know, different. St stuff that you don't let out about an organization, about your own players. This isn't that. I think this is him going to bat for himself and the yeah. other referees, which I think you have to admire a little bit. But, I, I you know, if a... You know, you, you, you just, you also can't, I don't think Eric Lewis, I don't think the refs want to be in a position where you're, you're doing that. You know, shout out to KD for opening shout up the world. <laughs> opening up the NBA world to the burner Burners. accounts. Burners. But this isn't the only ref. The, Jerry Colangelo wasn't the only GM. Kevin's Brian. not the only, Brian Colangelo yeah. isn't the only GM. Can't be. Kevin isn't the only player. They, you, you've probably interacted with some burners of some important people before. Like, how do they get busted? I don't know that yeah, this affects the game. Caught? Like, I don't, you know what I mean? You're, we all go home and vent about our jobs and complain, and, and he did it on Twitter. And so, you know, it is how, what it is. Complete side note, how about the Wizards girl that got so lit? She had, remember, did you see Wait, this a couple weeks which ago? Wait, what was it? She went on the Wizards account and posted. Oh, she was on Snapchat, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was on purpose? She thought she was on her... It didn't her switch back chat, over, yeah. and she posts, oh, like, a girl doing, like, a stanky leg at, like, a bar. <laughs> oh, dear. I didn't was, know they must have been in Nashville. It was close. That, that, that was in Nashville. We got to follow up. Did that girl ever get fired? Whatever <laughs> happened. Let's follow up. We'll get back <laughs> quite to you the, Quite the meeting quite, after that. Quite the one-on-one. -on -one. I, I just hope that this is the, the extent of which, I mean, he's already being punished, obviously, not working these finals. So, I mean, they can always hide behind the fact that maybe he wasn't going to be picked to work the finals. Probably not true, but... I hope that's it. Maybe I, it's not breaking any rules. You know, you know, fine, maybe, and keep, yeah. keep it moving. Yeah, I mean, it's probably embarrassing more than anything. He's probably embarrassed. But again, now. unless he's tweeting, like, oh, he did this call on purpose, or he... he <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, or like, Scott Foster hates Chris yeah. Paul and talks about it all the time. Exactly. That yeah, would there be was something like that that actually exposed some juicy detail of something, but, like, <laughs> this guy just venting, like, as he would with his wife at home, I don't see the big deal. 
I don't either. It's kind of a funny story, but I also hope it's over with soon. Um, we are take a quick one. When we come back, we begin the two-day process of previewing a big, important game three. Oh, dear. <laughs> Mike Malone is losing it. <laughs> He's sick of his ass, man. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> When NBA playoff games tip off, there's no better place to bet than FanDuel, America's number one sports book, because now you can build a same game parlay after the game has already started. Live SGPs are just one of the few new features added for the playoffs. Go check it all out right now on the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NBA. Of course, we've got one more sleep until the games resume. That's tomorrow night heat. Uh, now they're in Miami. That's the mm -hmm. fun part. The next two, by the way, they're all tied up. Chandler, biggest adjustment you need to see from Denver. Well, Coach Malone said it. It's the effort, right? There's no surprises now. They know each other's games. You know what you're going to get. The, you know, It's all about who executes more, who follows the scouting report more, the game plan more, who's getting those 50-50 balls. And that's always been a weakness of the Denver Nuggets, right? They've never been a great defensive team. They have a lot of personnel there that aren't the toughest guys, that don't play the hardest, and, and they, they defend. They, their, their defense is predicated on their offense. There's a lot of guys like that when the ball is not going in, are we taking plays off? Are we not rotating to the next man? So I think the biggest thing for them is the, is the effort. Everyone knows they're a favorite. Everyone knows they're a more talented team. That doesn't scare the Miami Heat. <laughs> they, they do not care. They've made that abundantly clear. So they have to play like their hair's on fire. They have to throw the first punch, and they have to be the more physical team and, and play harder. If not, they're, they're letting this huge upset happen right before our eyes. I'm going to be the bad guy yes. <clears throat> and say Jokic needs to step up on defense. Oh. I know he scored 40 points. I know he is the best basketball player alive right now. But if you watch that game, they continue to attack him at the top of the key over and over and over again. And eventually they sagged off. Eventually they found different little adjustments to try to uh, clog up the lane a little bit. But earlier in that game, it was a layup line. It was a lot of dunks. It was a lot of stuff going on. And a lot of it was Jokic at the point of attack. So. Some of that will, will lay on him, and then, yes, the effort thing. But if your coach is asking for effort in the NBA Finals... That's weird, so right? That's a problem. That's a really weird time to be asking for something so basic. Do you agree it's Jokic, the player that needs to step up? I No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, would, I, I would more go towards some of the role players. Michael Porter mm -hmm. Jr., mm -hmm. Tavis Caldwell-Pope, they need to shoot the ball better from three, and I think we saw in Game 1, the difference in Game 1 and Game 2 is... Then Nikola Jokic, I think the passes were on point. The guys just were not making shots. And I think Michael Porter Jr. really is an X factor for this team. When he's when he's playing well, when he's making shots from the outside, which he did in game one, uh, this team is is you know should be the favorite. Yeah, Pope can't be one of four and mm. Porter can't be two of eight. These guys can't combine for eleven points. They've been critical throughout the first couple rounds of the playoffs and, and they're been they're those other guys that we all again, we all know what Jamal Murray's gonna do. We all know Jokic is gonna have crazy triple doubles. It's what those other guys can do and can they match the production of the Caleb Martins, of the Duncan Robinsons, of those other role players because the, the stars are going to shine so it's going to come down to those guys and especially Michael Porter. He's one guy that I took from, from Malone's press conference that <clears throat> it, it, even if shots aren't going in, even if you are two for eight, you have to affect the game, you have to rebound, you have to defend um, and he's got to find a way to do both but hopefully, you know, Shots are falling for him. By the way, we didn't get into it too much, but I know Kerr was on Draymond's podcast, and he said that the head of the snake for Denver is Jamal. not Jokic, it's Jamal. It's Jamal Does anybody Murray. have an issue with that? We good with it? No, I agree. You do? Because it's, when Seems he's weird. making shots, when he's driving to the rim, when he's using the Jokic pick and roll in the way he does, that offense huh. explodes to another level. I think the league has decided that there's nothing you can do with Jokic. Fair. <laughs> you let him score 40, or he gets a 30-point triple-double with 17 rebounds. <laughs> but it, since there's no way to stop that, you turn to the next best option. And if you can if you can calm Jamal Murray down, you have a chance in the game. And that happened last, the other night. He, he shot bad. He made two big shots late, but hit a bad first three quarters. And, and the Heat ran away with it. It doesn't sound yeah. right, though. No, I disagree. I think there's, there's a reason Jokic is a two-time MVP, not right. Jamal Murray. There's a reason that he's one of the best centers of all time, and Jamal Murray's not one of the best point guards of all time. He is the head of the snake. Every offense goes through him. I agree, they are a much better team when they get a lot of production from Jamal Murray, and he's efficient, and he is, he's talented enough to explode for these big games. But no, when you have a seven-foot center that can handle the ball, that can bring it up, that can facilitate, get everybody involved with, that guy's the head of the snake. He's the one that's causing the double teams. He's the one that's collapsing defenses. So um, I disagree with him on that, but obviously Jamal Kerr. Murray is a critical piece. Coach giving us weird 
phrases. <laughs> uh, that's going to do it for us today. We will be back bright and early tomorrow with Matt Barnes. I'm sure it will be peaceful and calm. <laughs> we'll see y'all then. Run it back, y'all. Run it all. Run it back, y'all. Run it all.